astronomers and space agencies around the world are right now focusing on a comet, the mysterious interstellar object continuing to fascinate researchers. And now the latest data showing that the comet is erupting in ice volcanoes. What exactly is happening and what it's spewing? Could that rewrite how we understand alien worlds? Our next story decoding the developments for you. A ghost from beyond our stars has come alive. Thry Atlas, the most talked about space object of recent times, has again shown a mysterious behavior. First identified as a fleeting guest, this comet is now revealing a core secret. Recent telescopic data shows not a smooth, passive ice ball, but a body scarred by extreme thermal activity. Scientists call them ice volcanoes. These cryovolcanic vents are rupturing the comet's nucleus, blasting massive jets of frozen carbon monoxide and water vapor into the vacuum. The eruption is colossal. The analysis of 3i Atlas latest images shows that it is spewing material plume, measuring hundreds of thousands of kilometers across. This extreme sublimation is transforming the comet. Some scientists now theorize that the characteristic tail is not one cohesive structure, but rather a chaotic swarm of smaller, fragmented debris. There has been endless speculation about the origins of comet. Thurai Atlas, since astronomers first spotted it in July. Much of the online speculation has centered around whether this interstellar visitor could be an alien spacecraft. As Thurai Atlas races past our system, on a once-in-a-lifetime year flyby, scientists have only weeks to gather data. After that, it will vanish into interstellar night, leaving behind more questions than answers. has rolled out the red carpet for the leader of one of its closest allies. Let's get to these visuals first. Prime Minister Modi received the Russian president at the Delhi airport, the Palam airport this evening. The two leaders shook hands, hugged each other, exchanged warm greetings before heading out in the same car. Prime Minister Modi broke protocol by coming to the airport to receive his dear friend, bringing that personal touch as well. Prime Minister Modi is hosting a private dinner for the Russian president at his official home as the two leaders aim to strengthen a nearly eight decade old partnership that has endured despite a very complex geopolitical landscape. In fact, the two leaders will be holding talks at Hyderabad House in a restricted format. The official engagements start tomorrow. That's Friday. This will begin with a meeting with the President of India at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. This is likely around 11 a.m. IST. And following that, he is expected to visit Rajkhat to pay tributes at the memorial, spending roughly 30 minutes at the site before heading to Hyderabad House, where the bulk of the diplomatic discussions will be taking place. What's on agenda? Just about everything from defense to trade, healthcare, alongside expanded cooperation in mobility partnerships, culture, people-to-people -people exchanges, and scientific collaboration. Remember, the Russian president arrived in New Delhi after four years for talks with the Indian uh, prime minister. And uh, the visit is about defense, it's about trade, but also geopolitics and signals to the world. All eyes are on the Modi-Putin meeting and what lies ahead, not only because the two leaders share that personal rapport, which, the, which has been, of course, talked about, but because the visit also comes at a rather turbulent juncture 
as far as the global political landscape is concerned. The last time Putin was in India, the world order looked very different. And at that 2021 summit, the two sides reaffirmed their special relationship and discussed military and economic cooperation. Three months later, the Russia-Ukraine war started. The West tried to turn Putin into a global pariah in a way, restricting his travel and also sanctioning Moscow. And that was also before Donald Trump returned to the White House, remember, and upended years of steady U.S.-India bonhomie with the rhetoric and some of the world's most punitive tariffs, throwing the Indian currency into a tailspin in a way. Now, that's the context against which India is hosting the Russian president at a time like this. It's both a symbol of the enduring ties, a message neither India nor Russia will be dictated to by Washington. In fact, Putin also in India after reasserting his red lines as far as Ukraine is concerned. And with the Russian forces making recent gains on the battlefield, the Kremlin feeling its position has strengthened. For India, the visit comes amid tense trade relations with the United States. After Trump unfairly accused New Delhi of quote-unquote bankrolling Moscow through the cheap oil purchases. A charge that led to additional 25% tariffs on Indian imports, remember. And it goes without saying, India looks after its interests. It always has. But the anxiety in the West has become visible now. And how? On the eve of Putin's arrival, the French ambassador, the German high commissioner, the UK high commissioner, wrote a joint op-ed in the Times of India titled, Russia doesn't seem serious about peace, quote unquote. In fact, India's external affairs ministry issued a sharp rebuke, calling it not an acceptable diplomatic practice. To advise India publicly on its ties with a third country, Europe may struggle to accept it, but the days of imperial instructions are long gone. India is a sovereign republic and it makes its own choices, its relationship with Russia going back decades and remains deeply entrenched. Russia is still India's biggest defense supplier. And during the war in Ukraine, the West did not care that its sanctions on Russia could have ripple effects across the world. And so India did what it needed to do for its own people by buying discounted Russian oil. Only after U.S. peacemaking in Ukraine failed this year did Trump actually try to vent his frustration by accusing India of funding Moscow's war machine and uh, the pressure uh, to stop buying Russian oil. The result, new sanctions, new tariffs. Some private sector buyers in India, in fact, have slowed purchases, but India has also agreed to buy more U.S. oil and gas. But the Kremlin also saying cooperation will continue. Its spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, admitted that the obstacles, admitted the obstacles, but also said that the impact on energy flows to India would be insignificant and brief. And that Russia has the technology to circumvent sanctions long term. But that's not even the real issue, is it? It's the fact that the West still does not understand India in a way. For decades now, New Delhi has pursued a policy of multi-alignment. So Trump's attempts to force India's hand have backfired and led to the worst decline in relations in years. Yet both sides know they are strategic partners. A new 10-year framework has been agreed to deepen defense technology intelligence cooperation and the trade deal is being negotiated, which India expects to finalize by the year end. But none of that signaling a break with Russia. India's position is consistent. It will engage everyone. Which then brings us to today. Defense sales will be central, especially Russian S-400 systems and the Su-57 fighter aircraft, along with growing trade and energy cooperation. The optics are clear. No court summit this year, but full state visit for the Russian president. Now, for India, this is normal. For the West, it's a problem in a way. For the rest of the world, the lesson is quite simple. The West should stop telling India how to run its foreign policy. And when Prime Minister Modi and the Russian president 
greeting each other and that messaging being put out, it's more than just a photo of. It's a symbol of a time-tested partnership, to say the least, and also a reminder that the world is no longer unipolar. Multipolarity is here. And in this new century, India will not just talk multipolarity. It will let its actions do the talking. In fact, on that note, some breaking news coming in right this minute. As far as sources to be on, the expected outcomes from President Putin's visit, let's just lay it out for you. The visit will go a long way in strengthening economic cooperation. President Putin traveling with a large group of business persons and India expects to improve the trade deficit with Russia. Multiple avenues being worked out to increase Indian exports to Russia, exports in the field of pharmaceuticals, automobiles, agricultural products, including marine products. Indian businesses and products will get a bigger market. And this will also boost job creation and well-being of the farmers. Multiple agreements and MOUs expected in the fields of shipping, healthcare, fertilizers, connectivity. More cooperation also to be seen in the people-to-people -people ties. Very significant mobility partnerships also, culture and scientific collaboration. So a host of those sectors on the table. Let's go straight across now to Sathant Sibyl, who's been tracking those developments very closely. A lot of anticipation, a lot of expectation. Uh, Sithant, if you can just lay out for our viewers uh, what is expected uh, to unfold as part of the agenda. And also, like we've just pointed out, multiple sectors and a host of uh, uh, those uh, issues that are going to be on the table. Well, this is a state visit and uh, all the elements of a state visit will be present, whether it's the ceremonial reception at uh, the Rashpati Bhavan tomorrow morning, whether it's the state banquet or uh, the press statements at the Hyderabad House. Uh, we know that several packs will be announced, including on the mobility aspect, shipping, um, trade deficit is a concern for India. India wants uh, Russia to buy more from India. And agriculture products uh, uh, are one such commodity at a time when Donald Trump's tariffs have kicked in. But the big picture clearly is uh, the emphasis on India's strategic autonomy, the visuals that uh, emerged from New Delhi earlier this uh, uh, earlier today, uh, in the last few hours, uh, uh, will be closely watched in the West, especially in Washington, D.C. The other aspect for Russia clearly is that at a time when it faces uh, Western sanctions and Western isolation, it clearly uh, has friends, especially in Asia, Asian giants like India and China, towards uh, uh, which it is looking for not only more stronger political relationship, but also stronger trading relationship. Right, and we are coming back to you, Sidhan, for further updates on that front. On to a story that comes from Egypt. It's about a clear message that the country is sending out regarding the return of artifacts held in Britain's museums. What exactly is Egypt saying? That it is not looking for the return of these artifacts, but it's also very clear that it wants the return of the Rosetta Stone. Now, before we tell you more about that, let's just break down for you what has been said. According to the Secretary General of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, many of the items on show in the UK were legally removed from the country and now form part of, quote-unquote, London's identity, he says, adding that they belong to both Britain and Egypt. Also saying that they went out of the country legally during the earliest time Egypt uh, allowed a division of the artifacts that came out of excavations and they are the best ambassadors of Egypt to attract a lot of audiences to come and visit Egypt. But here's what he also said. The Rosetta Stone had been taken from Egypt unlawfully by the British during wartime and that they would love it to be returned because Egyptians have never seen it, according to him. Generations read about it and know about it, but they have never seen it. And there are lots of voices in Egypt thinking, we should argue for its return as it is their right. That is what has been said. Now, for those unaware, the Rosetta Stone basically is an ancient Egyptian artifact. 
The stone is on display at the British Museum in London. And just for context, the British Museum catalogue alone lists nearly 50,000 objects from ancient Egypt, including mummies, wall paintings from tomb chapels and statues. On to a story that has triggered a series of questions and serious concern. This story comes from Kenya. A report by the Kenyan parliament into the conduct of troops stationed at a British military base close to the town of Nanyuki in Kenya has alleged human rights violations, environmental destruction and sexual abuse by British soldiers. You heard that right. Basically, a parliamentary inquiry in Kenya accusing British troops training there of a pattern of sexual misconduct allegedly and environmental harm that has led the forces from the former colonial power to be seen as an occupying presence, quote unquote. The inquiry into the British Army training unit in Kenya was carried out by Kenya's Departmental Committee on uh, Defense, Intelligence and Foreign Relations. And reportedly, the findings of the investigation by the Parliamentary Committee focused on defence and foreign relations. Reportedly highlighting rising frustration in the country over the conduct of soldiers from the British Army Training Unit, Kenya. Who have faced a raft of highly publicised accusations in recent years, reportedly. In fact, a spokesperson for Britain's Defence Ministry said in a statement to Reuters that the ministry deeply regrets the challenges that have arisen in relation to the defence presence in Kenya, quote unquote, and said that it was prepared to investigate new allegations in the report once evidence is provided. Just for context here, thousands of British troops can pass through Kenya for training missions in any given year, reportedly. In what has also been reported, the committee's report, which was dated November 25th, but published on the Parliament's website on Tuesday, said it had uncovered a disturbing trend of sexual misconduct by those personnel marked by rape, assault, abandonment of children fathered by soldiers, allegedly, as has been reported. In a statement it provided to the Parliamentary Committee, the unit said it has zero tolerance for sexual exploitation and abuse and takes any allegations very seriously. It added that environmental audits showed high levels of compliance with the Kenyan regulations. The current defence cooperation agreement between the two sides was signed in 2021 and expires next year. To stay up to speed with the latest news, download the Weon app and subscribe to our YouTube channel.